We appreciate everybody coming out this morning. Uh, taking a few minutes to kind of invest in yourself and your future. This was a tough, tough presentation to explain in the postcards and the information, uh, but it's one of the, I think, most important ones we've ever done. And actually, it really ties in with our philosophy uh, very directly. So we appreciate your coming out. As many of you know, we were founded, Carver Financial, in 1990 with a pretty simple vision of trying to make people's lives better, our clients, our team, and our community. And that's really what today's program is about, is making your lives better. We're going to take a look at some major concerns, I think, that aren't often spoken about, but which are really key to our emotional and life satisfaction as we age. Now, in 1999, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, created something called the Age Lab. And the idea was to study all aspects of aging, from how technology impacts us, how we use technology, um, how we do things. And then equal to that was the idea and the belief that innovation and how products are designed, services are delivered, and how we live um, or policies are implemented are going to be critical to, to the quality of our lives in the future. The key for us, as with financial things, is to make good decisions today that are going to impact what's happening down the road. And the answers to the questions that we discussed today um, are really very important in that decision-making process. And if nothing else, hopefully they'll inspire you to start thinking about some things that perhaps you haven't thought of before. Now clearly, at least in my opinion, it's, it's a pretty amazing time to be around. I mean, the pace of change in technology is just accelerating like crazy, which can also be pretty overwhelming. I mean, how many of you guys have smartphones? I mean, that phone has more technology than the first lunar lander had in it. And, and we're carrying it around in our, in our pockets. But the problem, as I see it, is as change accelerates, we get inundated with information from, from all different sources. You know, it used to be a couple of newspapers and three TV channels. You had ABC, NBC, and CBS. And now you've got 500 TV channels and you know, 100 million websites and everything else. And I think the problem is kind of sorting through all of that to figure out what's relevant and what's, what's important for you. Our process is a little bit different. You know, people ask what we do, and the fact is we really don't sell investments, and I don't think we do financial planning. You know, what we do is, is personal vision planning, which is actually something we have a trade name registration on. Most firms are very investment-centric. Everything's based on the investments. Whereas what we want to focus on is what you're trying to do. What's your vision? What are your goals? And then how do we do it? Whether it's the investments or tax planning, um, estate planning, that those are just tools for achieving whatever your ultimate vision may be. So developing and implementing a plan <clears throat> needs to be based upon what, what your goals are. So when people say, you know, what the market do and how do I do compared to the market, who cares? I mean, the benchmark should be you, not the Dow or the S&P. The benchmark is, can you live today the way you want to? And more importantly, will you be able to live that way tomorrow and maintain and enhance your quality of life without worrying about running out of money? You know, and unfortunately, a lot of planning was based on our parents. You know, people would retire at 65, they'd live to 68, 69, 70, and that was it. You know, retirement was about five years. Well, now people retire at 55, and then they never die. You know, they live forever. So retirement's 20, 30, 40 years. It just goes on and on and on. So I think the first thing is figuring out what's important to us. You know, getting above all the noise, you know, whether it's the election or the ISIS or this or that, and what's important to us, and then proactively planning for that future that we envision. 
I think a lot of people don't even know the questions to ask. They, they don't know what five years should look like or ten years should look like. And none of this is difficult. It's all very simple. It's just not very easy. And I think it's very easy to get distracted from that course. We have a good plan. But there's so much noise about the latest crisis, the latest this or that. And especially during an election season. Because you have to understand, politicians to get elected, there's got to be a crisis. There's got to be something that you're hiring them to solve. If everything was fine, we wouldn't need them. So no politician's ever going to come out and say, everything's great. Because you wouldn't need to vote for them. They need to say, oh my God, look at these problems, and I'm the one that's going to solve it. And especially this election, which is just very strange. Um, <laughs> you know, we're getting, getting all that. Someone just told me Donald Trump just rented uh, Quail Hollow for the RNC. It's going to be interesting. I think the other thing is, um, while it's easy to say and understand certain things like when the market goes down, don't worry, we're going to worry. I mean, that, that's an emotional reaction, not a, not a logical one. And you hear people say, well, you know, when it's down, add to it. And you're thinking, well, I'm retired. I can't add to it. I'm on a fixed income or I have fixed assets. One of the things that our process looks at is, is, again, rebalancing with what you have. So when things go up and down, that, that still can work to your favor and at the very least doesn't hurt you because we can take advantage of that simply by proactively rebalancing. Now, when, when things go down and people say, what should I do now, it's too late. It's like buying an alarm system after the house has been robbed. You know, it's, it's happened. What we want to do is proactively look and say, do we have enough cash for the next six months? Do we have enough income for the next year? Because then all these distractions just don't matter anymore, as long as we've planned, planned for those types of things. Now, we work as a team. So whether you speak to me, Mark, Gail, Nick, Andy, Greg, Mike, Bobby, Nancy, Becky, to Jane, to anybody on the team, um, we do work together. Um, and as I say, well, I think in our opinion, one of the biggest challenges we're going to have is the ability to maintain your lifestyles in the future. And we understand that. Um, but that's also why there's a number of us so that we can, we can do that. We do believe there is going to be tremendous growth in the domestic markets over the next three to five years. But it's important to understand that markets going up doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to feel better off. It's also very important to differentiate between what's good for the markets and good for investments and what may be good socially. We could have 30% unemployment, 20% inflation, and it really doesn't matter if the markets are going up. If you look at the early 1980s, you had 14, 15% mortgages, you had 11% unemployment, you had 11% inflation, in 1982, the Dow was at 777. It's pretty ugly. Over the next five years, the market went up 300%. And then the complaint was, well, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Pretty much. You know, and that, that's probably what we're going to see now. We expect inflation to pick up. We expect unemployment to pick up. You know, as you get better technology, you need less people to do things. Whether you take it just for manufacturing, you take the real extreme, they talk about self-driving trucks and cabs and all the other stuff that's coming. But that can also translate into the markets doing well. Corporate profits are at some of the highest levels they've ever been. Corporate cash is at some of the highest levels it's ever been. We have more proven energy than any other place in the world right now. 100 years of proven energy in the United States. We have most of the fresh water, which is really critical. There's very, you know, a lot of places are running out of water. You may have seen the talk about the Saudis now are buying land in Arizona to grow alfalfa for their cattle back in uh, Saudi Arabia because they've run out of water. And, again, we, we're really a leader in technology. So I think the future is, is very good for people that invest properly and don't get distracted, but it's going to be very hard to uh, 
to avoid some of that. But, you know, regardless, as I say, there's, there's 18 of us. I think it's one of the best educated, most experienced teams in the country. Um, and, and we're here for you. Now, as I said, one of our core values is to try to help the community. Three years ago, we started a new initiative called Carver Cares. The idea was twofold. One, to bring awareness to local nonprofits that can benefit all of us and that do benefit our community, and two, to help them monetarily, although the awareness is the primary issue. One of the, the best resources we have, and especially as we talk about this subject of aging in Lake County, is Lake County Council on Aging. I don't know, maybe you've heard of them, have utilized their services, or volunteered to work for them, because um, it's a great place to do things. But the Council on Aging um, has been around since the 1970s, and I'd like to just briefly introduce Joe Tomsek, somewhere, there you are. Um, take just a minute to kind of tell you about their mission, bef vision before we uh, bring up our speaker. Thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate this opportunity, of course, to be here this morning, and I say good morning to uh, each and every one of you, and I thank Carver Cares for this opportunity. Um, as we gather this morning to socialize and, and laugh and eat and, of course, learn, there are thousands of seniors right here in Lake County who no longer have that opportunity to leave their homes. They're restricted by um, illness, um, what have you, some uh, debilitating factors that uh, cause them to be restricted to the confines of their homes. Um, there was a report recently released by the Lake County Board of Commissioners um, that tells us that the fastest growing cohort here in Lake County, the 85 plus, growing so fast that in less than 14 years, it will increase by about 54% um, here in Lake County. So that, that group. What we know at the Council on Aging is that this is an ever-increasing population. We are trying to do what we can to prepare for that ever-increasing uh, uh, older population. Our annual report for 2015 details all of the services that we provide. We've left some of the brochures on the tables there. It's exactly what Randy Carver has on the screen here, the quality of life. That's exactly what we are all about that if we can provide services and programs that enable seniors, their caregivers, their families with the resources that they need so that the senior can age independently where we all want to age in our own homes and, and enjoy a good quality of life. I can tell you that in that annual report, we um, delivered some 150,000 meals last year to homebound seniors. Can you imagine what it means when they get that 11 o'clock knock on the door? Oftentimes it's their only connection to the outside world. And for those next few magic moments when our volunteer driver is there with the hot meal, the greeting, a few kind words, that person is connected. And it of course also provides a little well check, which means that we're oftentimes at the right place at the right time. And not a week goes by when we're not on the phone with 911 because somebody has fallen, someone's had a heart attack, somebody's stuck in a bathtub, that type of thing. So I just want to take this opportunity, uh, Randy, to thank you um, for us uh, to be here. We've, we've shared some information on your tables. I also brought along some of our Bridge newspaper, which also has the uh, annual report for 2015. And um, your support to the Council on Aging is always so appreciated, where we can give back to those men and women who helped build this great community that we have here in Lake County. So thank you for your time this morning, and uh, back to Randy. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker. Um, John, John deals with the Hartford Funds. He's named as Senior Vice President in 2007. Uh, he's led the Retirement Wealth consulting group which is responsible for building awareness and knowledge of retirement challenges and really helping discuss the latest strategies uh, for handling those challenges. You may have seen John uh, quoted things like the Wall Street Journal, uh, Financial Planning Magazine, on Wall Street Magazine. 
He's also appeared as a featured guest on CNBC and Bloomberg Television. So, John. Thank you. Thanks and good morning, everyone. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm probably going to stand more over this way because at five foot three inches tall, the podium kind of swallows me up, if you know what I mean. Uh, by introduction, yes, my name's John Dio. I've been with Hartford Funds now a very long time, about 28 years. But the last 11 years, I've been studying aging, not just in the United States, but around the world, and not just as it applies to financial services, but really as it applies to a host of different industries and companies, thinking about three main things, demographic changes, technological changes, and cultural changes, and how those shifts will impact the decisions we make by, by training, yes, I'm a financial planner uh, by nature, but financial planning and planning for our futures is a lot more than just investment strategies to Randy's point. And so this morning, uh, I'm going to introduce you to some concepts that are developed for the last 11 years. I've worked in partnership with a group called the Age Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the rocket scientist up in Cambridge. They actually have a division of their school studying aging. Now, I have to ask, because I do ask every crowd that I speak in front of, are there M any MIT graduates in the crowd? Because in the spirit of full disclosure, I didn't go to MIT. I was in the half of the class that made the top half possible, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I do direct our research agenda with MIT. I'm typically up in Cambridge two to three times a month, uh, A, directing the research agenda, and then the rest of my time is usually spent two to three cities a week, sharing with groups like you and groups of financial advisors and other industry uh, conferences and interested parties about what we're learning. So that's what I'd like to do today. Uh, first, a little bit about the MIT Age Lab. So the Age Lab is actually located in MIT School of Engineering Systems. But what's nice, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary program. Students from Harvard's Medical School. Also, students from MIT School of Architecture and Design also students from the Sloan MIT School of Business, all working with business interests, as I said, inside and outside financial services, thinking about how changes in demographics and technology and culture is impacting the products that we're all going to be looking for, made available in delivery systems that we're going to use to help us age longer, live longer, live well, and extend not only life expectancy, but years of quality work. Now, I'll take just a minute to explain to you, because I think it's kind of interesting. They have some very interesting research techniques. By the way, the guy in the picture is a fellow by the name of Dr. Joe Coughlin. He's the PhD that founded the H Lab back in 1999 and continues to run it today. So some of the research techniques. Up at MIT, they have a suit that you can put on. The name of the suit is called AGNES. It stands for, because uh, everything at MIT is an acronym, Age Gain Now Empathy System. And the purpose of the Agnes suit, which has been designed by Harvard's medical students as well as the MIT engineers, is that I could take any of you in the room, regardless of your age. I could dress you in the Agnes suit that comes with a helmet, goggles, boots, gloves. There's gears and straps and weights. The whole purpose of the suit is, regardless of your age, I could calibrate what it would feel like for you to be 80, 85, 90, 95 years old. Restricted movements in the joints neuropathy in the feet that may slow the gait, vision impair. I know what you're thinking. Who in their right mind would want to wear a suit like this, right? And before you ask, they haven't invented the suit that takes us the other way. When they do, there will be a line around the block, right? But think if you were the CEO or senior management team of a large U.S. retail chain. Let's say CVS Pharmacies, for example, which CVS Pharmacies is a fellow co-sponsor of the MIT Age Lab. And you were concerned about whether your stores were laid out in a manner that was accommodative to an aging U.S. population. What better way than to take that management team, dress them in the Agnes suit, dial them up to age 80, and go shopping in their own stores. So that as you go to reach for the high volume item that's either all the way on the lowest shelf or all the way up top, and your elbows and knees and pain begins to shoot through your neck, the light bulb goes off. If you haven't visited a CVS pharmacy lately, Next time you do, take a look around. You're going to see some changes coming. One of the changes you'll see, shelf heights will be lowered. Who's the main consumer for CVS pharmacies? It's the aging female consumer. 
And ladies, as you age, you're likely to lose an inch or two in stature. And look, I can speak from experience at a towering five foot three, right? Get me in a store where the products tower above my head. One, it's hard for me to understand where in the store I am and where I'm supposed to be. Secondly, the physical limitations of being able to reach that product are a concern. And thirdly, what you, well, another change you'll see in addition to the lower shelf heights is those big long aisles of products will be broken into islands. Islands that are more easily navigable by an aging U.S. population because when you're in your 40s, yeah, making your way down around the end cap, not such a big deal. When mobility becomes a bigger challenge, just the energy it takes may impact your experience in the store. And CVS knows that your experience or perceived experience may influence the decision about whether you ever grace the doors of that establishment to begin with. Another industry uh, that's being, uh, being worked with in terms of MIT, just about every major auto manufacturer is working with MIT, thinking about the impact of aging on driving. And uh, perhaps some of you today drive cars equipped with automatic braking systems, or now what they call blind spot technology, right? Somebody pulls up in your blind spot and the bells and whistles go off. Well, that's because if you think about it, as we age, yes, muscles atrophy, reflexes slow, even something like neck rotation becomes more limited. We began working with MIT back in 1999, studying aging, aging and driving because our parent company, the Hartford, some of you may know is the auto insurer for the AARP. And what we looked at back then was accident rates and aging were moving in tandem. What we discovered was if some of these technologies could be adopted into the automobile, perhaps we could reverse that trend in accidents and aging. And we have, in fact, seen that. So if you want to know where auto technology is going, and I'm not talking about waiting for the Google car, right, where you'll whistle and your car will show up like silver used to show up for the Lone Ranger, right? There are innovations coming. Soon your car will be able to tell how you're feeling behind the wheel. Are you falling asleep at the wheel? Are you over anxious? And you say to yourself, how in the world is that going to work? Well, think about someone who's falling asleep behind the wheel. What happens to your horizontal scan of vision before you fall asleep? You actually develop tunnel vision, right? You, you stop scanning from side to side. And what else do you stop doing? You stop blinking or you slow your blink rate. What would happen if your car, through the heads-up technology that's being developed to display instrumentation on the windshield, would be able to monitor your horizontal scan range or your blink rate? And if it sensed a change in homeostasis, or normal state, it would take steps to stimulate you in some way. Maybe the steering wheel vibrates or the driver's seat vibrates. After you peel yourself off the ceiling, perhaps it's a reminder that to avert an unfortunate circumstance, maybe time to pull over for a cup of coffee. If you think this is totally crazy, if any of you are car buffs, you may realize Mercedes-Benz in their top line of automobiles in the 2014 model year introduced, you ready, aromatherapy into the automobile. Not yet tied to the car's operating systems, but I can tell you this from the experiments I've seen. Lavender calms you down, vanilla stimulates. So if you get out of the car at the end of the day reeking of either vanilla or lavender, it would be a pretty good signal to those around you what kind of day you had. I guess my point through these examples is that the research that MIT is doing has practical implications. But you all came to talk about retirement, planning, aging, kind of what's going on there. Well, before we get into the bulk of it, I'd like to ask you a question. And that is, if instead of coming this morning to enjoy a nice breakfast, and to talk about planning, investing, retiring, whatever the thought was, what if instead we came to put together a jigsaw puzzle? If we did, what would you say the most important first step would be? Shout them out. Corners, straight edges, two most popular answers. Sometimes people say you got to flip the pieces over. All important steps, not the most important first step, which is? You have to look at the picture on the box, right? Now, some people would say that's cheating. I would say if you don't look at the picture, that's insanity, right? But um, trying to think about what that picture on the box looks like is important because once you understand what the picture is, you begin to arrange the pieces so that that image comes out. Here's what MIT is telling us today about the average American consumer. It's very difficult for many of us to think beyond 12 or 18 months, let alone 12 or 18 years. Right? And one of the reasons for that, and I'm going to share with you what MIT says, is influencing what they call our personal agenda. Essentially, these are the issues that on a day-to-day -day basis 
you're managing, you're making decisions about that are kind of occupying the priority space in your mind. They say that based on the volume, velocity, and complexity at which life is coming at us today in the United States, it's harder than ever to find that space to put the deep thought into what is it that I want to do? What do I want life to look like? What is life likely going to look like now that we're living not just into our 60s and 70s, but maybe into our mid-80s to mid-90s? So the first issue, volume, let me explain. The researchers say that today in the United States, many of us are now living in four-generation families, where we may be providing care for our aging parents at the same time we're raising or supporting children or grandchildren, sometimes in our same homes. And so if you think about the number of issues just connected with extending longevity, and remember the American family isn't just growing this way, it's also growing this way. Because as we live now into our 80s and 90s, we greatly increase the likelihood of divorce, widowhood, and now many of us may not have just two parents, we may have three or four parents when we consider step-parents, step-siblings, so on and so forth, that kind of enter into our circle of concern. So all these bubbles up here, it's what I call my ride home from work. I want you to think about that quiet time during your day when you start to think about all the commitments, all of the issues, all the roles that you play. And what the researchers at the lab say is many people are now juggling more issues based on the demographic trends than we ever have in the past, which is made more complicated by the velocity at which life comes at us today. So Randy asked the question about iPhones. I have another question for you. Does anybody remember when Steve Jobs introduced this device? Not the 6 Plus, but the original Apple iPhone into the US economy. Anybody remember the year? It was January of 2007. 2007. The technology's only been around for nine years. Seems like it's been around forever. Interestingly, sometimes uh, groups will tell me, well, John, you don't understand. We're we're a little bit older. We don't really utilize technology like some of the other generations. And my reply is, oh, really? Because MIT tells us that Americans 60 plus are among the fastest growing group of adopters of technology. Are we using it to keep up with the stock markets? We're using it to keep up with the grandchildren. Because if you don't text, email, share Google calendars, we run the risk of falling off the family social agenda. Right? So we're adopting the technology. But here's what you need to know about the technology. It's changing the way we consume in America. It's changing the way we research. It's changing the way we make decisions. And it's largely playing on trends in trust in US society. So consider this, and this is something maybe you felt, but the researchers at MIT have actually studied it. Back in 1960, if you asked the general American population, most people could be trusted, yes or no. 56% of the country would have said yes, most people could be trusted. In 2010, that dropped to 31%. We've lost trust in every credible source of information we used to believe in. Corporate America, government, experts, celebrities. In fact, remember the saying, trust no one over 30? Well, now that we're all over 30, we've just truncated it to trust no one, right? <laughs> one group of people we still do trust, though. We trust other people who we deem to be like us. What we're finding is, for the first time, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to espouse this view, but we're finding if you can find someone taking the same prescription medication as you are, you'll liable, you're liable to trust their experience. Did it work? What were the side effects? How long did it take? Would you do it again? More so than I may trust the doctor who prescribed it. Again, is that a valid way to manage our... I'm not going to vouch for that. Or think about something easier. Many of us, let's say you're in a town where you haven't spent much time. You're getting hungry. Uh, you need to find a restaurant. How do you find restaurants today? Anybody pull out one of these? Go to yeah. Yelp, Google, uh, Urban Spoon. And when you visit TripAdvisor, yeah. Visit any of those sites. Where will you spend your time? You'll glance at star ratings. You won't need a one-star rated place. Where will you spend all your time? Reading user reviews. And if you're like me, you throw out the top two, written by the restaurateur's brother, right? <laughs> throw out the bottom two, written by somebody who freaks out if the salt shakers aren't filled. But somewhere in the middle, you'll form an opinion about whether you'll trust that person's experience and do business with that vendor. So it's influencing the way we buy. But most importantly for us, talking about volume velocity, every technological innovation since the washing machine was going to do what for us? It's going to create all this time we would have for contemplation and recreation. Is that what's happened? No, we've actually crammed more and more onto the personal agenda. Our research now shows the average American 
spends four hours a day on their mobile device. I mean, it's hard to think, but it's easy to monitor. We just put a little bug on the screen and watch how often the screen is active. It's information that is, and again, with, with the overpopulation of information comes a deficit of attention. The distractions that Randy talked about, you're going to constantly be distracted by whatever the latest quote-unquote crisis is. So maintaining discipline in a world of technology is ever more important. So m more issues coming at us faster. And lastly, I want you to think about the amount or the proliferation of information now available at your fingertips on both sides of any argument you want to throw at me. Is today a good day or a bad day to drink coffee? How about a good day or a bad day to drink red wine? Now, clients are usually like always a good day for red wine, right? Um, how about you thought your blood pressure was in a good range? They changed the standard. You're out. You learned how to eat in my food pyramid. It's not a pyramid anymore. It's now my plate. New research, new insights. Just when you thought you knew all the answers, they changed the questions. Has it made decision making easier? No, it's actually convoluted the process because now we load ourselves up with all kinds of information. If we make a decision, we spend the next six months second guessing whether we did the right thing, so on and so forth, and it convolutes the decision making process. Volume, velocity, complexity. And now I'm going to add one more on top of it. It's the only table full of numbers I'll throw at you, and I'll give you an easy way to think about it. The fourth one is longevity. And I'm going to focus you in the bottom right-hand corner because these numbers kind of are easy to remember. We call it the rule of 6336. 6336, just reverse the digits, right, as a way of remembering. What those numbers stand for is if I have two people today in the United States, both age 65 and married, there's now a 63% chance that one of the two will live to age 90. There's now a 36% chance that's greater than one in three that one of the two will live to age 95. And ladies, I probably don't have to share with you who the odds are in favor of there, right? But the fact is, Americans still tend to underestimate their own longevity. So one thing I'd like to ask, I always take a straw poll, and if you'd like to participate, I want you to think about just a limited set of your family tree, just your parents and grandparents. And raise your hand if any of your parents or grandparents live to age 85. You'll see a lot of hands in the room. Age 90, keep them up. Age 95, I want you to take a look around the room. So, and I have to ask, age 100? Yeah, in a group like this, thank you. In a group like this, I would fully expect a couple of age 100 plus to mirror the point Randy made earlier. It's the fastest growing demographic segment in the United States today. In fact, MIT believes that the, that the babies born today will have an average life expectancy of at least 100 years old largely due to improvements not just on the other end of life in terms of medical advancements, the mapping of the human genome, but because of the enormous strides we've made in terms of infant mortality and public sanitation systems, so on and so forth, since the early 1900s. And so they're not way out there on the Google curve of saying living for 500 years and all that kind of stuff, but they are saying, yeah, age 100 is, is pretty real. Well, if we're going to live, if there's a likelihood that some of us will live into our mid-80s to mid-90s, it changes the paradigm <laughs> at which we kind of approach uh, the way we handle quote-unquote retirement and what we're going to be doing there. And so with that as a backdrop, I want to share with you these three questions. There's three questions MIT says that anyone age 45 or older ought to be asking themselves on a fairly regular basis, either about yourself or about someone that you care about that are predictive of your future quality of life. So as you think, so 45 year old, and by the way, you don't have to scribble these down. We actually have a kind of a summary of these three questions that you can take with you if you'd like. But before I launch into the three questions, I just want to warn you, they're probably going to underwhelm you in their simplicity coming from the rocket scientists at MIT. But if you give me just a minute, we'll touch on each of the issues pertaining to the questions and why they're so important. So you ready? Here are the three questions. Who's going to change your light bulbs? How are you going to get an ice cream cone? And who are you going to have lunch with? Now, I know you may be thinking, what in the world is he talking about? First of all, let me explain the psychology of an engaging question. Most people that come to see a financial advisor already have a set of questions they anticipate hearing. Stocks, bonds, cash, assets, liability, net worth, just the facts. When I start asking you about light bulbs, lunch, and ice cream, you don't even know what I'm talking about, let alone whether you agree or disagree. So if all we do is capture your imagination for a few minutes, maybe we can plant a seed 
on these three really important issues. Let's talk about light bulbs. 90%, that's 90% of Americans say that they intend on aging in their own homes. How many of us have even spent 30 or 40 minutes thinking about the services, the changes or modifications that may need to be made to that home in order to make it livable, not just into our 60s or 70s, but into our 80s or 90s? Because we know that if we look at demographic data, housing-related expenses for American households over age 65, the number one category of expense. This comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I know some of you may be looking at it and say, yeah, John, but that's the entire population. We're a little bit, we look a little bit different than the general population. I'll just share with you, it doesn't matter where we cut income, it doesn't matter where we cut assets, the priority of spending and the percentages actually change very little, about a third of your average out-of-pocket monthly expenses. Could be mortgages, yes, but also could be home maintenance. Could be handyman services, housekeeping services, landscaping services. By the way, these things don't usually occur on an average monthly basis. The roof leaks one month, the hot water heater blows up three months later, right? Expenditures, and by the way, as I mentioned those things, I should point out to you, here's a little tip to take with you. Many of the carpenters, plumbers, electricians that you've relied on over the past 10 or 20 years, we know they're aging out of their professions faster than you're aging out of your need for them. One of the things you ought to do in inventory is that the people that you go to to utilize for these types of services, is there a continuous business plan that they have where that service will be continuously provided? Because guess what? When mom is age 87, it's not the time to be inviting the electrician who you've never met before and you know nothing about them into her home to try and take care of an issue that she has. Right, so thinking about those critical service providers that you use. As I said, here's some of the areas that we're utilizing, but importantly, that very first category, home modifications, is growing in importance. Why? Here's the list of the top 10 home modifications to existing homes. The average American home was built in 1975. It is aging as well as its occupants. And when we look at these things, level entryways, living on one floor, kitchen and bath improvements, all 10 of these things are meant to prevent one thing in the home. What is it? Falling, right? A fall can change the picture on the box in a heartbeat. And so we have to think critically about the homes we're living in and what changes may need to be made and at what point do they need to be made and how do I begin to develop some concept of what this will cost if you're not also taking in an inventory of whether the home you live in today will actually be the, the home that you're able to age in as life goes on. I'll just share with you, my family and I live outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, not far from Valley Forge Military Park. Our home was built in 1860. It's got the foot thick stone walls, not a single bedroom on the first floor, not a single full bath on the first floor. As my wife and I thought about the picture on the box, it doesn't include the home that we love so much that we raised our family in. A few years ago, we began to look for where we would go next. And by the way, MIT says you'll now move as many times after age 50 as you did prior to age 50, as you downsize, as you seek to be near children, as you, whatever the motivations. But we were fortunate enough, we found a place in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where we kind of spent our summers growing up and raising our family. But the important part is all the bedrooms on one floor, all the bathrooms on one floor, and it's a golf cart ride to the beach, the golf course, Kroger, Walmart, restaurant row in between, and it's three miles to the hospital. Right? So thinking critically about the space where we live is very important. A, about whether the home will accommodate us. B, whether, whether there needs to be changes or we need to locate services that will help us either because we can't or we won't want to do those things that maybe we did in younger years. I'll bring up two changes that we're seeing in terms of what people are thinking about. And I only bring them up because I always encourage people that we ought to always be thinking about a plan B especially as we age, as I shared those longevity numbers with you. Is it realistic to think that mom at age 89 is going to be lifting dad at age 91 out of the tub? Right? It probably is. Now we can pretend it isn't, and that's fine. But here's what I always say. Two forms of things that I want to kind of educate you on. One you probably heard of, CCRCs, Continuing Care Retirement Communities, Independent Living, Assisted Living, Skilled Nursing. You know the average age American moving into independent living? And you know independent living, we don't need a lot of medical supervision. We're doing pretty good. Maybe, maybe the house got too much to take care of. The average age moving into independent living, 83 years old. We are living in our homes as long as we can, but at some point it may become 
not as tenable given the maintenance requirements, so on and so forth. And so CCRCs, here's what I would tell you. If you haven't done any investigation, I wish I could point you to a website to say this is where you go if you want to see rankings on communities. It, it doesn't exist. You have to do your own homework on these types of communities, whether they're age, over age 55 communities, CCRCs, whatever they may be. Because the reason you don't want to do it, or the time you don't want to do it, is when you're 85 years old or 86 years old and somebody gets a call and says, you know, dad just fell and broke a hip. We got six weeks to figure out what to do. That's the time in which families make big mistakes. Right? So doing a little legwork. What are the costs? What are the services? What are the communities where you would say to yourself, you know, if I ever needed it, this would be a community that I would consider. Have you ever communicated that to anybody? And if at the end of the day your answer is no way, no how, not in a million years, at least you're making an educated decision. The second change we're seeing, that very top one, the village movement, you can breathe easy. This isn't the villages like the ones down in Florida. This village movement actually started in the Beacon Hill area of Boston back in 2000. And essentially, in fact, if you Google Beacon Hill Village, you can still see what I'm talking about. The original template is out there. It's a bunch of people living in Beacon Hill that said, we love where we live. But we had smaller families where our kids don't live near us anymore or they're involved in dual income households. They don't have the resources and or the time maybe to pitch into our care the way previous generations did. So they formed an association of sorts. Not to make sure we all paint our mailboxes the same color, but for the purposes of negotiating home modification services, transportation services, legal services, anything that I might need to allow me to stay in that community for as long as I can. And what you find now is children oftentimes are paying the dues. The reason I bring it up, these villages have been popping up all over the United States. They're actually growing pretty rapidly in terms of the communities that are, that are served by that template. So the very first question is about that physical home you're living in and thinking critically about that space. The second question, how will I get an ice cream cone? Pretty popular. My first question is pretty popular. Who likes ice cream? Right? Yeah, it's pretty. So here's what I want you to think about. How are you going to maintain access to those small things that make life worth living? So the first challenge is I want you to think about those small things that make life worth living, the things that bring meaning and joy to everyday life. I'm going to give you a little hint. Those things usually fall in four buckets. Usually, if you could tell me these four characteristics about yourself, I think I could begin to paint a little bit of a picture about what your picture looks like. Could you tell me where you were educated? And when I say education, I mean more than college or university. I'm talking also about armed services or vocational training. Because our education is actually a big source of identity for us. It may actually clue me in to the types of people that you're going to want to remain connected to as you age. Can you tell me where you recreate? What are the things you like to do? Can you tell me where you congregate? Where do you meet and socialize with other people? And can you tell me where you donate? And I mean more than money. Where do you give of your time and your talent? Educate, recreate, congregate, donate. Those four things are extremely important motivators as we age. Let me just share with you back to our pie chart for a minute. There's food, about 13% of out-of-pocket expenditures. Generally splits about 60, 40, 60% groceries, 40% dining out. I could argue the dining out piece is recreate or congregate. There's recreation, entertainment, 5%. Cash contributions, donation, about 6% of out-of-pocket expenditures. And now the number two category that crosses everyone up. So the number two category of out-of-pocket average monthly expenses for households over age 65, and it's not health care. The answer is, any guesses? The answer is transportation. The cost of fueling, insuring, maintaining, and if you amortized it, replacing your automobile, your means of accessing those small things that make life worth living, is the second highest expense. Add on there travel to see family and friends, right? So. Why so important? Well, it's something that many of us take for granted, but we happen to know that today in the United States, 70% of Americans live in suburban and rural communities where if they lost the ability to drive, their quality of life would be severely impacted. And so I've got good news. Remember, guys, so far we've been on the bad end of the good news as ladies are going to live longer, all that kind of stuff. I've got good news for all of you in the room. It may be hard to see in the back, but you see my friend there down in the lower right-hand corner in the pink shirt, hanging out in the pink car? He's got a big smile on his face if you can't see it. There's a good reason for that, and that is gentlemen. 
As we begin to approach age 85, let's face it, we start to become more popular because there's fewer of us around, right? <laughs> if you want to be the Casanova, the senior living community, there is one skill that you want to keep sharp, and it's not dancing. It's driving, and if you can drive at night, rock star status, right? So keep it sharp. You want to keep those casseroles lined up down the hallway, you take everybody anywhere that they want to go. Who was the most popular kid in high school? Was the one that could borrow the keys to dad's car, everybody could pile in, and they gave us access to the things we wanted to do when we wanted to do them. The same holds true on the other end of life's aging parabola, right? Being able to continue to access. We didn't ask, the reason we asked this question we didn't ask how you're going to get to your doctor's appointment. Somebody will figure that out. The reason we use the ice cream cone, it's a beautiful night in May. All you want to do is go down the road a few miles to enjoy an ice cream cone. If you lost the ability to drive, would you still be able to do that? How would that work? We know that transportation today is about 16% of that average monthly budget. So here's what to think about. I'll just share with you some changes we're seeing on this front. The fastest growing populations of Americans age 65 plus are beginning to spring up around college and university environments. Why? Well, they have education, right? So classes, and I understand the state of Ohio has some pretty attractive options for taking classes at state institutions, maybe even for free, if you wanted to monitor those courses. By the way, what's interesting about taking those classes, you enroll in a class, you unlock a whole nother social network of people interested in the same things you are, right? So we'll talk about that in a moment. But education, what else do those communities have? Well, they have culture, sports, theater, uh, music, you name it. But think critically now, what else? Hospitals, teaching hospitals, medical clinics, top medical talent. And if you really think about it, if they don't have walkable access to many of the things we desire, restaurants, entertainment venues, movie theaters, so on and so forth, they usually have transportation developed so that it can ease the access to those things that we find important. So those communities are ones that we see growing. But the other thing we see growing are what I call these multiplexes that are kind of popping up all across the United States. They're these large, like, several-mile square shopping districts, right? High-end retailers, high-end restaurants, uh, movie theaters, sometimes grocery stores. Sometimes there's a medical annex connected to them. And if you look really closely, condominium units, townhouses, either situated in the community or closely around it. And I know many of us think, well, that's because that's where the young people are going to be living. Live, work, play communities, right? True to an extent, but the other population that's swallowing up those properties, Americans age 60 plus, who say, I love the Cleveland area, not 12 months a year. Four months a year, I'm going to be chasing my dreams or my grandchildren somewhere else around the United States. And the thought of locking the door and turning out the lights, disappearing for three or four months, showing up three or four months later, Unlock the door, turn on the lights, it pretty much looks how it looked when I left it. And I may now have long-term rentals in other areas of the country. Be it in Florida, be, maybe I just wonder what it would be like to live in Seattle for a few months. You know, companies like VRBO, companies like Airbnb, now popping up to satisfy these needs. So the second question is about the community you intend to age in and whether you'd be able to maintain access to the small things. And if you're thinking about relocating, Think about rebuilding your social network around those communities, which is what the third question is about. And I would argue the most important of the three questions. Who will you have lunch with? One of the things we need to think about is that if we're going to live into our 80s or 90s, it's probably going to be with a different group of people than we grew up with in our 20s and 30s to a large extent, especially for the men in the room. Why do we find this? Men, for us, our social networks are primarily situated around the primary workplace. And when we leave that primary workplace, oftentimes men are not as efficient at rebuilding social networks around, like women are. Women will quickly rebuild social networks around family, entertainment, hobbies. But for men, we have to be pretty intentional about the organizations and the groups that we're going to maintain contact with. And why is it so important? Because it's your social network that will do two really important things for you. It's your social network that will get you up off the couch, out the door, physically moving, giving you a place to go and a reason to be there. And secondly, give you mental stimulation. Things to look forward to, new people to meet. Men, one of the biggest issues we will face in this new period of longevity, and I know you're going to laugh, boredom, right? Thinking about what's going to fill our days. In fact, what we see now 
is that Americans are actually using the word retire less and less, especially as they approach age 62, 65, 67. And they're starting to talk about what comes next. Right? Anybody ever hear of a company called Uber, the ride-sharing company? You know, 25% of Uber's drivers are over age 50. They get the highest ratings of any drivers on their system. And the number one reason they give for driving is not economic, social interaction. If I weren't doing anything else, I'd be sitting around the home. Right? So seeing how these technologies may create new markets and opportunities for us to be able to participate. So we say work, but probably not work in this, as in the same 20 or 30 years, the first 20 or 30 years of your career. Working for a nonprofit, working for a cause I believe in, working part-time. If you're a small business person, not working 10 days a week, working three days a week, and then just on the things that I like. Right? So it's changing, but it's important. We know that we had fewer children, smaller families. We're more likely to live alone. Today in the United States, about 43% of women over age 70 currently live by themselves. Divorced, widowhood, never married in the first place. And, as I mentioned earlier, we live in suburban or rural locations. If we look at the age wave, here's what it looks like to the researchers at the lab. This point over here, I know it's hard to read in the back, I'll just describe it to you. This is percentage change by growth, by age cohort, 2010 to 2020. And what my graph here will show you is that by 2020, there will be 56% more 70 to 74 year olds in the United States. It's not the most important number on the graph. That would be the 40 to 54 year olds, which is where the red line dips below the X axis. Growth rates in that category are negative. You know them as Generation X, we know them as the caregivers. What many of us will realize is that yes, family will participate in our care, but because we had smaller families and because of the social construct, our care will be, need to be oftentimes supplemented by paid services, but also by contributions from our social networks, our faith communities, civic organizations, organizations like the Council on Aging perhaps. Right? So our care will be supplemented. Social networks are extremely important. I put up a comic strip here to make light of it, but Dad says, at last the kids have grown up, there's time for us. Mom says, good, you stay here and mind us. I'm going to go get a life. <laughs> right? It's because of that, that rebuilding the social network. We need to think about the pursuits that we'll continue to pursue in the next 20 years, just like we were so determined in the first 20 years, whether it was raising a family, starting a career. By the way, MIT now says that kids graduating from college will likely have three careers in their lifetime. They say that the average half-life, not even a half-life, the average full life of an MIT graduate's knowledge will expire in 11 years. By the end of 11 years, they'll have to go back to school because things will have changed so dramatically in that time period. So anyone from the education business, you should realize there's, a, there's an entire revolution going on in terms of education and how to best serve those kind of needs. And so as we think about that social network, here's a group called the Cardinal and Gray Society from MIT, 50-year alumnus. Every time we get them together, we always ask them, what's the secret? They always come back with something saying, you got to have a purpose. You got to have a reason, right? Finding joy in working or volunteering is what many people will point to. The key is we need to maintain that social network, whatever it is. I understand with Carver Financial, there's some interesting opportunities, these crazy trips to the Amazon or Cuba or what. I mean, that is a great place, right? To get together with other people like you to enjoy experiences that you might not otherwise have. And I'm, I'll bet you form some pretty lasting relationships as you kind of go on these trips and form relations, whether it's around physical activities, whether it's around community participation, education, whatever it is. But I do want to point out a really important thing, the second to last bullet point. Crucial that you integrate younger people into your social network as you age. Yes, it's younger people that keep us young through the energy that they bring. But here's the real reason. By integrating younger people, you'll virtually guarantee that you won't outlive your social network. Right? You don't want to be, you don't want to be the last man standing, and you could argue it beats the alternative. I would argue back, not if you've ever met someone that's ever lost all those around them that made life worth living. Thinking about the groups that you interact with and you engage with. That engagement, both Yale and MIT says, the strength and breadth of your social network may be one of the single best indicators of healthy aging. And so we'll round out my pie chart. If you were wondering where healthcare is, it's right here at 13%. We expect that category to grow. In fact, it grew 1% in the last year. If any of you are from the medical industry, you can probably tell me this better than I can tell you. We're in the midst of a healthcare revolution in the country today. 
The mapping of the human genome just a few years ago is creating new pipelines of pharma, devices, therapy, so on and so forth. Anyone follow the story of former President Jimmy Carter, diagnosed with cancer a few years ago, has been under the treatment of what's called an immunotherapy drug, where we're now training the body's own immune systems to attack cancers based on the genetic makeup of the patient and of the cancer attacking them? Or think about the marriage of technology and biology, biotech, right? Anybody ever hear of something called the magic contact lens being worked on by Google and Novartis? The purpose of the contact lens is by wearing a contact lens it will measure the blood glucose in your bloodstream, transmit those findings to your cell phone, which can be self-monitored or shared with your doctor or adult caregiver. If you were monitoring a chronic disease like diabetes, the quality of life you would find wearing a contact lens versus taking multiple needle sticks a day, you're going to want the technology. But it's probably not going to be paid for by social insurance. right? Take one more step removed. Carpets, like many of us have installed in our homes. You know, there are carpeting companies now that are being married to technology companies. Carpet is now available for install in your home that can be tied into the home's communication systems so that the carpeting can sense the fall of a body mass on the floor before anyone knew that a fall occurred in the home. Forget about having to get to the button that says I've fallen and I can't get up. The carpet's already called the EMTs. They're on the way to your house, right? Another use of this carpeting, when do most falls occur in the home? In the wee hours of the morning, right? We get out of bed, it's dark, we try to get to the bathroom, we forget the dog stretched across the floor, trip over the dog, bad things happen. The carpet can be programmed that if your normal sleeping hours are between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, and the carpet senses a footfall in the bedroom, immediately turn on the lights, illuminating your way to the bathroom, hopefully minimizing the risk of fall. Now, I will warn you, my wife has informed me that if the lights in the bedroom come on at 3 a.m., half of us are not going to have a longevity problem to manage, right? <laughs> so, buyer beware on these new technologies. What difference does it make? There's the all-inclusive other category. Well, it changes the way we should think about the decisions that we make. Remember I talked about that picture on the box? Here's what MIT tells us. Maybe not for you folks if you're already doing business with Carver Financial, but they say that a lot of folks go through life collecting pieces, right? We have the 401k plan where our, from the ex-employer where our mother is still named beneficiary. With the IRA account where our ex-brother-in-law was going to be an investment advisor down at the bank. So we've got pieces spread all over the place, but either we've never done it or we haven't done it in a while where we've sat down with someone to clarify what the picture on the box looks like and how the pieces might be efficiently arranged to bring that image out. So, you know, as we think about it, uh, here's what MIT tells us. They say that when we think about planning, many of us are prone to think just about the quantitative side. Not that it's in incorrect, it's just that it's incomplete. Many more today are thinking about the qualitative aspects. How can I make the most efficient use of my wealth given what that picture on the box is for me? I'll describe it to you this way. Let's say you go to the uh, you go to the hardware store and you buy yourself a drill, a drill bit, and an extension cord. Most people who went to the hardware store, did they really want a drill, drill bit, and extension cord? What did they really want? They wanted a hole, right? <laughs> the drill, drill bit, and extension cord are just component parts of getting the job done. Based on what I told you earlier about the volume, velocity, and complexity, we know it's harder and harder for us to think about what that job is that we're trying to get done or we want to get done. What I would share with you is probably the most unappreciated respect of dealing with a quality financial advisor is being able to hear them share the stories of other people like me. Maybe they've already helped, maybe they have personal experience with helping people in the same stage of life or in a similar transition or having the same thoughts as some of the things that I'm thinking about right now. See, because if we were doing a jigsaw puzzle, the, the easy part would be the picture on the box doesn't change. But we all know as life goes on, the picture changes. People change, ideas change, goals change. And you need something that can, can kind of modify as you go along as these changes occur. So I'll end my comments with a quote from Dr. Joe Coughlin who says, look, effective planning has to be about more than financial security. It now adopts a, an integrated and holistic approach to helping people prepare to live longer and live well. I did bring along some party favors for you, and if you're interested, you certainly, I think we have them on the way out. Um, one is a white paper that was written by the MIT Age Lab that's a summary of these three questions. 
And what I would encourage is a couple of things. One, it may not be you. Maybe you've already been thinking about some of these things, but maybe you have a family member or a friend that maybe you think ought to be thinking about some of these things that you've already been spending some time on. Take some extras. That's fine. The other thing I would offer is if, if you think about any of those families or family members or friends, we're doing a similar presentation to this one uh, this evening. And Randy, Randy will be able to share with you the location. But if you had said to somebody, hey, you ought to go see this or you want to come back or whatever you want to do, yeah, we're preparing a, a similar presentation for this evening. The other piece that's back there is what we call a, it's a three questions worksheet. So essentially it's a bunch of blanks. But it kind of prompts you through some of the questions that are kind of the subset questions of those three important questions. And here's what I would ask. As you think about this presentation over the next week, two weeks, as you maybe look over that white paper, if there are issues that come to mind, oftentimes I'll have people say to me afterwards, I can't believe you just said that. We just had this conversation. Or let me tell you about what it's been like trying to take care of dad who doesn't live in this state and so on and so forth. Any of those situations come to mind, jot them down on one of these pieces of paper. Next time you come to see Randy and the team, bring that with you as the start of a conversation. Because asking these folks to, to put together that picture on the box with you without sharing what that picture on the box looks like or some of the main drivers makes it very difficult for, the, for really the quality financial advisor to do their job. So with that, I'll end with a, a quote from my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, who said, the future ain't what it used to be, right? <laughs> we wholeheartedly agree. That's why we'll continue to do our research with the folks at MIT. Hopefully in the future, we'll have a chance to come back and kind of share with you what we're learning on a different topic or in a different year, so on and so forth. But in the meantime, I know I'll be around if there are any questions or comments. But thank you so much for your attendance and your time. I hope we gave you, in addition for food for your tummies, maybe some food for thought as well. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Sure. Just very quickly, I do want to thank John and Brendan Hartford um, for sponsoring this. We do have another one this evening, so as he said, if you have friends or family you think could benefit, they're welcome to come. It's going to be up at uh, La Malfa about 6.30 p.m., and we do have space. Just show up, and we should be fine. Um, the next big presentation we have is in September. It's Andy Friedman from CNBC, the Washington Insider. So we talk about the election. If we're doing two sessions, that will sell out. I mean, we did this a couple years ago and sold out very quickly. So if you have interest, we're going to do an evening and a morning. Um, <clears throat> if you go on our website or you call the office, they can hook you up with that. We do um, have a number of things this summer. Here are the usual social events, the golf outing. We moved to Fowler's Mill. And then we have our car show and our baseball game. So it's kind of a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff coming up and then the fall we're gonna have an estate planning update uh, kind of a town hall meeting with the guys from the office so that's gonna be in November so we do have a lot of things coming up but as always if you have questions you know contact any of the guys in the office um, or certainly when you come in for your reviews we can talk about talk about those types of things is there anything else we do have Four spaces left for Cuba now. It's just about sold out. And I don't know what we're doing the next year. People get, so if you have ideas, feel free to email them. But uh, we'll figure out 2018 once we get past 16 and 17. But uh, Cuba is going to be a very interesting trip. So, well, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>